For those of you who are taking writing workshop, today's Wednesday, February 16th, 2022. We're working this week to complete our final draft. And I want to share with you some points that I'd like for you to take a look at, both in terms of your partner's text as well as your own text. The idea here would be to listen to each of the points I want to share with you, pause the video, check your text, and then come back and go to the next point. Try to take each one of these issues one by one, each one of these points I want to share with you today. Pause the video and check your entire text. Take each one and uh, see if you can detect how it relates to your own text and also how to change it. If at any point you have some questions about how to either recognize the uh, the issue or the point that I want to make, the points that I want to uh, share with you today, or you have questions about how to fix it, these are conversations that you can have with your partners first and then with uh, me if further clarification is needed. All right, so I'm not going to go in in any particular order. Uh, I kept a list of notes as I was going through and looking at all of your text. Some of what I mentioned here today might be repetitive. Some of it might have been shared with you all uh, yesterday. But I'd like to uh, provide this extensive uh, feedback session, so again, each one of you can go at your own pace and check each one in turn. Okay, so the first point that I want to make uh, here, and I'm, I'm going to add to this list that I'm sharing here on my screen. And the first point being, please remove all extraneous information from your Word document. So when you submit your final draft. When you submit your final draft, you want to make sure that you've already removed all of your comments in Word, any outlines, any notes to yourself, any highlighted text. Make sure there's no bold text except for the level one headings. Um, and yeah, we want to submit our final essay uh, with no extraneous information. The next point that I'd like to make is to make sure that in your references, you include at least three references from peer-reviewed journal articles. Okay, if you have more, of course, many of you have more than three, but try to include at least three coming from academic journal articles. Those are the ones that are going to typically have a volume number, maybe an issue number. Uh, they'll have the, the pages, they'll have the name of the journal, the name of the article. Obviously, the authors, the year it was published, and so on. Okay, so try to include at least three in your references. We talked about level one headings. Make sure you have a title for your essay. And remember, the title of the essay should be typically between six to 12 words. And we're only going to have two Headings. We'll have the title of the essay. That will be your first level one heading. That'll appear at the top at the very beginning of your essay. And then we'll have a second level one heading called references. That will be on a separate page just below your essay. Make sure you have a page break so you start a new page for your, your references heading. Remember that level one headings are uh, main words are capitalized, centered to the page, and in bold. Okay, so check your formatting there. Now, the next point, we, we've talked about this, so I'll just briefly mention it again. This is what we looked at on Monday, I believe. But this has a lot to do with constructing or developing body paragraphs. Make sure you're following the meal plan. Make sure you have a topic sentence that directly relates to the, one of the key ideas listed in your thesis statement, make sure that the topic sentence is more specific than the, the key point that you mentioned. Okay, it should be very specific to the one key idea for that body paragraph. Make sure that evidence comes before analysis sentences. Remember that evidence sentences offer details, examples, facts, statistics. And for our purposes, for our academic text, we're going to only include evidence sentences that have a citation that are coming from an outside source. The 
topic sentence, the analysis sentences, and the linking or summarizing sentences that make up the rest of the body paragraph are all going to be our original idea. Make sure you have a good balance between evidence and analysis. That doesn't mean necessarily that you have exactly the same number of sentences. It's possible to have one extra sentence as evidence, one extra sentence as analysis, but you could go too far and have too much evidence and not enough analysis or vice versa. You might need more evidence to support your analysis. So look at each of the three body paragraphs that you're including in your final draft to make sure that you have a good balance between those two. Make sure that you have a paragraph indentation. Each of the five paragraphs of your essay should have a 0 0.5 inch indentation. Yesterday I did a screen share showing you step by step how to go in and format using Microsoft Word, how to format and include those indentations using the ruler, changing the units a measure if need be from centimeters to inches. The introduction paragraph, make sure that the introduction paragraph includes three things. It begins with a hook, followed by the uh, context of the problem. And the last sentence of your introduction paragraph should then state your thesis. It should be your thesis statement. Okay, so the introduction... Remember, when you start with a hook, you have basically three options. It can be an essential question, it can be a famous quote, or it can be a fact or a statistic. The fact or statistic will need to include a citation and a reference, right, according to APA. So make sure that if you're using a fact or statistic that you have the appropriate citation and reference. The famous quote, all you need is the person's name, the quote itself and the person's name or anonymous, if, the, if it's an anonymous quote, or an essential question. Now, essential question, this is not just any question. This needs to be a deep thinking, profound, um, philosophical even type of question. And so try to keep that in consideration when you begin your introduction paragraph. The only, if you choose to use a question, an essential question to begin your paragraph as a hook, remember that that will be the only time that you uh, introduce a question throughout your essay. Avoid rhetorical questions, except for perhaps the hook. Okay? Avoid rhetorical questions throughout the rest of your text. Personally, I like uh, famous quotes to begin uh, essays, uh, but the choice is yours. Uh, right, so the next point, um, make sure that each paragraph, the introduction paragraph, the three body paragraphs, and the conclusion paragraph have at least, or I'm sorry, have between five to eight sentences. Make sure that each of the five paragraphs in your five paragraph essay has between five to eight sentences. The next point. Check to see, this is going back, I'm sorry, jumping around here again. This uh, is in no particular order. Check to see in the introduction paragraph that the context of the problem that you're introducing or you're saying something about the what of the problem, the why, the how, the when. Anytime you're thinking about, well, how can I, what can I say more about this particular idea, in this case, the problem in your introduction paragraph, use the question words to help guide you Think about what else you can add, what else you can say about the thing that you want to say. So the problem, have you described how the problem exists or how it, yeah, maybe how it came about, maybe a cause and effect, some kind of relationship there or a historical relationship, but how did it happen? Why did it happen? How, and, and what is the problem? The what in your introduction paragraph, describing what the problem is, is definitely something you need to say. This is probably the most important question word that you need to include in the introduction paragraph. When you're thinking about your topic sentences and you're asking yourself, well, what else can I say? How can I make this topic sentence more specific? Use the question words as there as well. 
May, have you stated how it happens, why it happens, to whom it happens? These are some uh, strategies to help you think about what else you can add to, in this case, maybe the topic sentence or in the introduction when you're developing the body par the uh, problem, the context of the problem. All righty, next, next point. All right, check to see that the thesis statement has the following order. Begin with the transition. Remember that we're going to be creating a or presenting the problem. We're going to say what the problem is, maybe how it happened, maybe why it happened or happens. It's current. It's current. Uh, in fact, your problem is going to be current. And then we're going to transition. We're going to segue from the problem to the thesis statement. And that transition that begins your thesis statement is your opportunity, your chance to make that connection, make that bridge. So what is a transition? Well, it could be a sentence connector. It could be an introductory phrase, like a prepositional phrase, participial phrase. Or it could be a subordinating clause to begin the sentence, right? It could be a subordinating clause and then followed by the topic. Usually the topic is simply the, the subject of the sentence. Remember to avoid subject pronouns, personal pronouns in your topic. So specifically state the topic, maybe an adjective or two, maybe a relative clause in that subject. It's possible. These are all ways you can make it more specific. And then the claim. The claim is going to be your verb phrase, maybe the object. This is going to be your opinion. Your prop it's, Maybe it's a proposition. It's going to be your point of view. It's your position. So remember that your claim is think of it as, an, as, a, a, as a debate. There are two sides of the claim or the position. There should be two sides. Now, you're only going to be asked to support one side, but there should exist. You should be able to conceptually think of the other side as there being an, a strong opposing view of your own claim. After you have presented your opinion or your point of view, then we're going to have some kind of connector, maybe a, a preposition, to introduce later than the three key points that are going to be the three key points that you're going to develop in your body paragraph. So you're going to have a list. Usually it's a list of, uh, of clauses with a subject and a verb in each of the key points, typically. So take a look at your three key points and then compare those three key points to more specific ideas in your topic sentences that begin each of your body paragraphs. All right, next key points. Next point I'd like to share with you. Uh, find cases, now this is more related to grammar, but be careful with the modal can. And then a verb. The modal can as an auxiliary verb in most cases, we can remove the modal can. All right, and this is just general advice. I would ask you to check. If you, if you find that you're using can multiple times throughout your text, probably best to remove, remove the modal. Okay, so take a look for, check your text for the modal can. Uh, see that there are no transitions to begin your paragraphs, especially the, the body paragraph, even the conclusion paragraph. It's really not necessary. I know that you, you have seen it done before, but I am suggesting instead to try to include linking sentences at the end of body paragraphs to connect those paragraphs. And since each body paragraph has a beginning, a middle, and an end, uh, in my view, having a transition to begin the paragraph is really not necessary. I would rather you start with the subject, a very clear, specific subject, and then offer your claim in the topic sentence. And in that way, it just makes it uh, that much clearer. If you're concerned about transitions from one paragraph to the next, then use uh, linking sentences as part of the meal plan that we've talked about. 
Speaking about the meal plan, I think we've we've talked about it. I just have it here again in my notes. Evidence begins from the second sentence. So just take a quick look through each of your three-body paragraphs, specifically the second sentence of each of your three-body paragraphs, and just make sure that you have an evidence sentence. Make sure that you have a citation as the second sentence of each of your body paragraphs. Then from there, there's some flexibility, depending on whether or not you want to have another third sentence, that's another piece of evidence, or if you want to break it down, a little bit of evidence and then an analysis and then another piece of evidence and analysis. All right, there's, there's going to be flexibility, but everyone should have, in, as a second sentence, uh, evidence that supports the topic sentence. Remember that an analysis sentence, your job there is to explain, to comment, to connect and explain how the evidence, the details, the citation that you included, how it relates back to the topic sentence. You have to make that connection as a writer. So though the analysis sentences are designed to uh, help you do that. They should function. That's their function is to make that relationship, that explanation. So think about explaining, comparing, contrasting, synthesizing information, whether it's synthesizing evidence within the same paragraphs or possibly connecting, comparing, contrasting, or synthesizing evidence or points that you made in prior paragraphs. It's also possible. As it relates, though, to the current piece of evidence in the body paragraph that you're referring to. Make sure that you have a balance, we've talked about that, between evidence and analysis. Okay, references. According to APA, uh, yesterday we talked about the how to come up with the references, how to format the level one heading. Okay, so at the top of your page, as a separate page, we should begin again with the heading references. Should begin on a separate page. It's going to be a level one, so it needs to be sent into the page in bold, first letter of the word capitalized. Remember that we always write with upper and lowercase lettering. So the first letter will be uppercase, the remaining part of the word in lowercase. Avoid overall throughout your text, make sure that you have no text that's all capitalized. Make sure when you're centering also that be careful with the slider bars at the top, go to your ruler and make sure that all the slider bars are flush left or all the way aligned to the left so that the references heading is centered. Okay, so if you have formats from your text, your body of your text, you're likely to have your slider over a half an inch, and that will affect the level one heading, the references level one heading. It won't be centered to the page because you'll have that indentation. So we need to remove the indentation again to ensure that the references level one heading appears in the center of the page. We talked about yesterday reverse indentation of your references. So make sure that you, you use the slider bars. Don't use the space bar to try to force the indentation. There should be, uh, I would just use the, I would select the text as we talked about yesterday in class. Use the slider bars to create your reverse indentation. Make sure you single space within each reference, double space with, uh, between each reference. Make sure you single space within each reference, double space between each reference. Yesterday we talked about, and I showed you step by step how to select all the text, single space everything, and then with the cursor and the enter key on your keyboard, you force that double space uh, between each of your references. Double check the order of your references. Now, this, this will depend on the type, but just as an example, most of us, in fact, we should all have at least three peer-reviewed journal articles. So typically, we're going to start with the author or authors. We'll have the year in parentheses followed by a period. Then we'll have the name of the article. Make sure you only capitalize the first letter of the word of the article. Period, space, and then we're going to have the title, the name of the journal. Now, the name of the journal, we're going to capitalize the main words. 
and the text is going to be italicized. This is the name of the journal. It should be italicized. It should be italic, uh, in italics, comma, and then we'll have the volume number, which is also in italics. Now, if you have an issue number, this will be optional. A lot of journals will have an issue number. Some won't. But if you do, include in parentheses the issue number immediately after the volume number. There's no space between the volume number and the issue number. And the issue number, in parentheses, is not italicized. So again, I think the easiest way to do this is look at an example um, and just compare what you have versus the example in terms of punctuation, which text is italicized, spacing, the order, obviously, of the structure, the order of the reference. After the issue number, you'll have a comma, and then you'll have the first page the number, the number of page that, that, that uh, the first pa page of the article, and then a dash, and then the last page of the article. Now, the DOI, there are some with DOIs, others without DOIs. Uh, double check your examples that I've shared with you guys in class. Uh, most, most of the articles these days have a DOI. The seventh edition, there was a change, so the DOI now is in the form of a URL. So make sure that you have a link, a URL, HTTPS, uh, and then the, the link. Okay, so double check that. Always make sure that the links are not broken. Make sure that the links actually take the, uh, the reader to the page, to the source. So check your spacing, italics, capitalization, and so on. Oh, finally, make sure that the references are alphabetized. Alphabetized by author, since in most cases, the first piece of information for each of the references is the uh, author. So alphabetize. A comes before B, B comes before C, and so on. Next point. Make sure that your make sure that you stay in the third person make sure that in your essay throughout your text you stay in the third person okay so no i pronouns no you pronouns this will be all in the third person i think yesterday we talked about this make sure you double space your sp your uh, text Make sure you have equal spacing between paragraphs and that you have equal spacing between the headings, in this case, the title of your essay and the first line of your introduction paragraph. Make sure that you use one of the approved fonts. Again, in the Sway presentation, I talk about, I actually show a list of the approved fonts. So if you don't like Times New Roman, that's fine. Got some options there, but just make sure you're using one of the approved fonts. Check your capitalization throughout your essay. A lot of times, writers will capitalize to emphasize. And if you are going to abbreviate a term, don't capitalize the term. You want to spell out the term first, then in parentheses you can offer a, an abbreviation, but the term itself should not be capitalized unless there's a proper noun involved, right? The word English will always be capitalized, for example. But if you're saying English language learners, and then in parentheses you have capital E, capital L, capital a second L, right? Then... We're not going to capitalize language. We're not going to capitalize writing out the word language or writing out the word learners. That's all going to be lowercase. And so double check your capitalization. Citations. Citations should be paraphrased. So put the, uh, put the idea that's coming from an outside source into your own words and use only parenthetical citations. That is, the citation should appear at the end of your sentence, and in the citation, you should include the author's last name and the year. Okay, the author's last name, or names, plural, 
and the year. Again, you can see examples in the Sway presentation. Paraphrase your citations and only use parenthetical citations as opposed to narrative citations. So we're going to avoid things like according to Ellis, according to Chomsky, Chomsky mentioned, or Chomsky states this, right? Those are examples of narrative citations. Instead, we want to focus more on parenthetical. Again, parenthetical citations, the citations at the end of the sentence and the author's name is in the citation. When you do that, that means you don't mention the author outside of the citation. Okay, so we don't want to do both. We don't want to mention the author and have the author in uh, the citation. I talked about abbreviations. Making sure the first time you mention a term that you want to abbreviate, that you spell out the word first. And then, in parentheses, you can abbreviate, and then thereafter, you can offer the abbreviation instead of spelling out the term. And I think my last point here, well, there's two more points. So this one here is uh, related to margins. Make sure, and this is by default, you shouldn't have to change the margins. In most cases, if you're opening up a brand new document and the template that I shared with you, it should have been set as a normal one inch margins, one all the way around. If for some reason that got changed and which can happen when you're copying and pasting text from a another Word document to the template that we are working in in Microsoft Teams, um, sometimes formats can, can change. And, and this is good advice anytime you're copying and pasting. It's likely you're gonna have to check the color of the font, the type of the font, the size of the font, your indentations, your spacing, your margins. When you copy and paste text from one Word document to the next, you're not just copying the text itself, but all the formats that are associated with that. So I know that that's, um, you know, that is going to be necessary in some of your cases, right? Maybe there's issues with connectivity, but just know that when you copy and paste, you're going to have to go through all the steps that we talked about yesterday in formatting in terms of spacing and, and fonts and indentation and all of those aspects. You'll have to double check those once again anytime you're copying and pasting text from one document to the next. All right, the last thing I want to mention here is a list of words and phrases that I would try to avoid. And this list that I'm going to share with you here today is not extensive. But these are typically words and phrases I would avoid when writing an academic text because it kind of forces us into writing more descriptively, maybe more objectively, which, which is our objective, really, for writing an academic essay. Try to avoid the word very, V-E-R-Y. It's okay to use the word very, V-A-R-Y, like various. But try to avoid... The word very. Try to word. Try to avoid the word uh, important or the phrase "it is important." It is necessary. It is vital. Avoid any form of the word important. Importantly, the importance. Try to avoid that completely. This forces us to write more descriptively. Number one, and it avoids us saying things like, "Well, this piece of text that I'm writing is more important than." than what I am, that I wrote before. And you're starting now to make a distinction between now some information you're sharing is more important than others when actually all of what you say or write is or should be important. If you want to stress or, exp or express something, the importance of something, right? don't tell, but show. Right? Show us how it's important, but through the evidence, through your discussions, that's where you're showing the, right, the reader the importance of what it is you're saying instead of telling the reader, hey, this is important. Try to avoid absolutes. Try to avoid words like every or everyone, never. This always happens. This never happens. All, no one. Take a look at your text and try to avoid absolutes because as we know, we're, we're dealing with human beings 
Yeah, there are no absolutes, right? So try to avoid absolutes. That's the list I have here. Oh, there's, sorry, one more thing. Looking back at my list here. The serial comma. We do want to use the serial comma, sometimes referred to as the Oxford comma. Anytime you have a series, whether it's a series of individual words, phrases, or clauses, we need to have that comma that occurs right before usually the connector and. So I like apples, comma, oranges, comma, and bananas. It doesn't matter if you're if you have a list of individual words or phrases or clauses, we need to have that serial comma, that last comma just before the connector, usually the connector and. It could be any of the fanboys uh, connectors, the coordinating conjunctions. Um, but try to check throughout your text. Of course, you're going to have a serial comma in your thesis statement for sure, but you might have other sentences that have lists. Remember, you need to have at least three items to have a list. If you are uh, just stating two things, I like apples and oranges, then in those cases, we don't need a comma. All right, guys, I hope this helps. Take a look at each one of these points one by one. Stop this video as you need to to check your partner's uh, text as well as your own text. Work together, help each other, make suggestions. Try to use this information in this video as a starting point for your discussions and looking more critically and specifically at uh, the, uh, at, your, at your text, checking your grammar, refer to the Grammarly reports as we talked about a little bit yesterday on Tuesday. We'll talk more about it today and the rest of the week as we uh, continue throughout the week trying to complete our final draft by Friday. Of course, if you guys have any questions about anything that I'm sharing here in this video, reply to the post where you found this video, or of course, send me a message in Microsoft Teams, or of course, bring it up in class and we'll, we'll discuss it as a whole group. All right, guys, hope this helps and we'll see you in class.